Good afternoon. My name is Mick Napier and I'm speaking to you on behalf of Stop the JNF. Um, I'm speaking to you from Scotland, so that includes Stop the JNF Scotland, but it's on behalf of Stop the JNF UK who have been putting together the programme, a very uh, impressive programme of discussions on the JNF, uh, which is introduced now by Salman Abu Sitta. Um, and we also have input uh, audiences from Stop the JNF International. Salman Abu Sitta, it's a huge pleasure and an honour to have you with us this afternoon from Kuwait, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Mick. It's always a pleasure to meet you and meet our friends who are supporting justice in Palestine. Salman, a large part of your life has been cartography, has been mapping, mapping Palestine before the dark shadow of Zionism fell over it, mapping the theft of Palestinian land and mapping uh, the institutions which control Palestinian landed property uh, today. Um, we hear that uh, an absence of maps was a major problem for the Palestinian side during negotiations at Camp David and Oslo and so on. Why have you dedicated your life to mapping, to cartography, to amassing this amazing data? Uh, why is it so important to you and to Palestinians? Man? It's a matter of necessity. Um, when you are struck with a disaster, the first thing to do is to uh, look for ways to uh, mitigate it. And um, what was surprising to me is um, that people from Eastern Europe, whom I have never seen, descended upon my country. As a child, I did not know who they are. I did not ever see a Jew, what he looks like. I was told that people came from overseas in ships in different shapes and different languages, they descended upon our shores and they started to attack us. And my concern was, as a child, who are they? Why are they destroying our life? And in fact, this is not a word, this is actually action. They came to my village um, in 24 armored vehicles and destroyed the school which my father built in 1920, they destroyed our homes, they destroyed our uh, equipment and even crops and so on. And that was on the 14th of May, 1948. That was the same hour probably when Ben Gurion stood in Tel Aviv and told his uh, settler friends that now you have a state. So when he declared there is something called Israel in the map, or on the record, that was the date when I became a refugee. So that was, of course, a major shock to my life and to my people. Ten years later, I uh, happened to be in London doing my PhD at University College London. So I wanted to find records of the land taken away from me. I knew it by eye, by experience but they have destroyed and burnt all the records we have, and they took others. So I wanted to know. I went to Royal Geographical Society, and I asked him, could I see maps of Palestine? They said, no, we have, we have no such thing. I said, are you sure? I said, Palestine. That was surprising because only 10 years ago, 10 years before, the British left Palestine after 30 years of havoc and transforming a peaceful land into a land in which wars never stopped since then. I said, How are you? you must be serious. You don't know where Palestine is. Uh, must be a lot of people who are still alive who are working there or soldiers there. And they I said, let us look at the map. I pointed Palestine on the map. I said, ah. Oh, well, that's Israel. And then I found all the maps and documents of Palestine under the name of Israel, which never existed before then. And so 
it is really a weird v uh, feeling that you look for your home somewhere else in the land which created Israel. Um, and I had, of course, to go over so many sources in, in England. It's not only one place. There are so many places. Um, and also in Paris, the Bibliothèque Nationale. And in, in Germany, I found in Munich the first, uh, the first uh, aerial photos of Palestine in 1917. Um, the Germans were chasing the British in Palestine in the First World War. So they were taking pictures of their camps and their soldiers. And this, uh, happily for me, um, showed also our villages. Uh, so I have a record of Palestine villages of 1917. Then uh, in 1945, after the British created havoc in Palestine and, and introduced uh, settlers from Europe who did not have Palestinian nationality, they amounted to the number of 30% of population. Um, they have not finished mapping Palestine. Um, actually, they did only mapping of Palestine, especially the areas uh, which they allowed the, the Jewish settlers to control. So they did a survey, aerial survey of most of Palestine um, in 1945 and 1946. And these are the only remaining uh, aerial photos of Palestine before um, the Zionists destroyed 560,000 villages. Um, by the way, I found them by accident in England in a remote place somewhere, I'm not going to say where, but then if you go back now to the same place asking for copies of these, um, they will tell you we don't have such things. And luckily I managed to um, buy and copy 5,000 aerial photos of Palestine before 1948. Because the Zionists don't simply prosecute a war against Palestinians today, they don't only prosecute a war against those who would support them in America and France and so on, but they also prosecute a war against the past. It's a war for memory. It's a war to eclipse the memory of the thriving society that existed there for so long. Um, you're, you're tackling that. You're trying to um, produce evidence that this is, obviously it's a monstrous lie at one level, but you're doing much more than that, Salman, with your work with your cartography? One of the strangest things of colonial history is this. In the old days, on the time of bow and arrow, a British fleet and French fleet and Belgian fleet also went to various countries and took them over. That's how Australia and Canada were created. Um, at that time, the aim of the colonists was simply to grab the land and probably to kill the natives who uh, are in the way. Sometimes they keep them uh, because they're useful as labor. Um, and they don't really care about other things as long as they have the land. And they have some of the natives who are obedient and who are useful for their work. But the Zionism waged several kinds of wars against Palestinians. Uh, not only they seized the land and destroyed all their towns and villages, but they also wanted to say they were not there, that the place was empty, that Palestine was empty um, with, ha with no people. So to do that, which is a big task, which is not successful very much, is to show that they have no history. On the history books and in, in Israeli textbooks, omits the time from Jesus Christ until Bolfar came. You find it empty. But the landscape of Palestine is full of monuments and villages and, and uh, historical buildings and roads and, and mosques and churches, which have being built by the people in the last 2000 years, but still they omit them. 
They also omit Palestine from maps. If you open a map today, they find the uh, names of places in Palestine to be erased. In our atlas, we listed 55,000 place names, which were known during the British mandate. And today, the Israelis planted by a committee 6,800, almost 10% of these names. Our names are created by the people during their life and their experiences and their description of places, hills and rivers and so on. And their places, their names are described by a committee to commemorate Ben-Gurion and Herzl. Um, there are so many examples. They wanted to obliterate uh, the record of Palestine and Palestinians. And that is really part of the mentality of the criminal. If there is no body corpse of the dead person, there is no crime. So what you want to say, there is no person there killed or no person expelled or nothing. And therefore there is no crime. But of course, this is a far-fetched thing. Today, as we speak, we have the good news that the International Criminal Court has allowed that crimes committed by, by Israel in the West Bank and Gaza, including Jerusalem, are allowed to be uh, 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 prosecuted uh, at the ICC. Of course, they will try all kinds of tricks. And unfortunately, some countries um, have aided them to do that. Australia, Germany, and Czech Republic submitted petitions to the ICC not to uh, prosecute uh, Israel, and they failed. It's, 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 not, it's not a book of old Roman history. It's something happening today uh, under the glare of camera lights and, and news agencies. So we are witnesses, uh, a very strange, a very weird and very uh, uh, evil kind of colonialism in which not only the gains which has taken uh, illegally before, but to destroy the name and the record of the people who suffered from that. And I think they will not succeed, but they have the power to silence everybody who speaks of that. It's amazing now today, as you probably know, Mick, there is a witch hunt in Germany. Anyone who speaks about facts about Palestine, that there are people there, there were villages destroyed, there are people uh, depopulated. Um, facts are known to you know, a child. If you speak about that, you are uh, prosecuted under law in Germany. If you think about freedom of expression, I don't know if you find anybody who has killed that expression so many times. I just can't believe it in this age. So it's not easy to extinguish the past. <laughs> and you're making it even more difficult, Salman. I mean, even archaeology, I saw something in uh, Sa uh, National Geographic, it was actually a front page, that uh, the mythology of an ancient, uh, you know, powerful Jewish kingdom of David and Solomon runs up against the fact that uh, archaeologists can find no trace of it. And that's 2,000 years ago. But today, given the colonial history of Palestine, the, the colonial power, even if they're pillaging India or Palestine, they usually have a bureaucratic and organized way. Um, and that means uh, land surveys. The Ottomans wanted to tax people. Um, so you've delved into these records that show um, the reality of Palestinian society going back not just to 48 and not just to the Balfour Declaration, but beyond that. Can, can you give us a brief outline of this amazing work, Salman? Well, um, it's so tragic in the age of communication and Zoom now with Corona, we still communicate and all that. You, you'd be surprised 
how knowledge which is simply which is simple to find is denied access to people it's amazing it's really amazing when people with intelligence university tv stations um internet emails with all this is flooding the world that people are not allowed to speak about a crime which is happening today it is not in the past it is in the near past but it is happening today and yet we tell people our history is not of today our history is very very long now the crimes committed by the occupation by the apartheid of israel of all palestinians not only in the west bank and gaza because the refugees are victims of apartheid as well the palestinians who are israeli citizens are victims of, of apartheid as well and me- members even- of the diaspora members of the diaspora who resist israel are often hunted down and killed in the streets of london or dubai or norway or wherever yes yes they are because they are speaking about what happened to them you see one fact is very clear the criminal is afraid of the truth who is afraid of the truth only the criminals because it exposes their actions so coming back to your question not only we have records of the present today and the immediate past which is the british mandate on the 70 years ago but also we published this summer a new atlas called atlas of palestine 1871 to 1877 this atlas is based on the british survey which came to palestine in this period and they produced 10 volumes yes this is the one thank you this is the one produced 10 volumes and um, 26 maps um, with 9000 names of places so some years back almost 20 years ago um, by the way this was organized by palestine exploration fund which is still in existence today so i made a contract with uh, pf to let me see the original documents and reports and maps brought by the british survey team um from palestine to london and they opened books for me not open for probably for 150 books and from that i checked and revised the survey made by the british surveyors so we found it's very useful information but some information was missing because they did not have time to do it our the technology at that time was not uh, uh, it was not able for them to include it we found so also errors of location up to half kilometer we also found 4000 names not mentioned by the survey and then we produced this atlas so of all the depopulated villages in 1948 you can find the names of these these same villages in this atlas then um it's 500 600 pages in color i can hardly carry it <laughs> 24 cm by 34 cm each page and then it's wonderful said, it's wonderful thank you um we then went further there must be records of palestine before then so we found the tax record of the ottomans when they came to palestine in 1516 it's a big volume listing all palestinian villages how many people live there and what do they plant what crops they have and how much tax they owe that's wonderful so we digitized that we created maps of palestinian villages in the 16th century 1596 to be precise then we looked at some other records of palestine we found the record of a palestinian bishop his name is eusebius in 313 ad 
a mere 300 after Jesus Christ. He wrote a book called Onomasticon. He was listing the names of villages in Palestine and how much distance there is between them. Um, these villages, I mean, his aim was to show the road to uh, Jerusalem for pilgrims. We then listed those names <coughs> in the map. And the amazing thing, which I dare say would not be found in any European cities, that you can find the names of villages in 1948, the same like those in the 313 AD, a situation which I believe not found anywhere else. A village is listed um, regularly within a period of 2,000 years. And then they call this a land without people. So this is not only a crime against the people, it's a crime against uh, history, against the, against the, uh, um, uh, it's an insult to every decent human being. But the story is not over yet. So we are working on creating a better end to this story. Salman, a friend of mine many years ago, before the, just before the internet started, a Sudanese friend, not a rich man, invested in a copy of the set of the Encyclopedia Britannica for his family. Largely a waste of money. I would think these volumes here, ah, these volumes here and your other one, The Return Journey, which is somewhere nearby, is something any Palestinian family who can afford should keep at home. It's their own story. It gives the lie to a land without people. And I think it's just a monumental work. And But how can, let me show you one thing if I may, Salman. I'm gonna share screen for a moment. Uh, if I'm technically able. I don't suppose anybody can see it yet, no? Okay, I'm a failure. Oh, there we go. It's, Salman, it's just a list of some of the Jewish National Fund parks and forests in Palestine. Uh, Western Palestine, North and South, and so on. And you can see from Australia to the USA, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Scotland, there's a separate JNF here, uh, Ireland, etc., Latin America. These parts are usually named after Europe and uh, settler colonial countries. A sign of solidarity with the state of Israel and the Jew so-called Jewish people um, embodied in the state of Israel. It's clearly a provocation. How can people use your work to get to the bottom of the crime? I think these are a list of crime scenes. Each part is a crime scene. How can we tabulate these crimes? How can we show the people of Australia or Ireland what is being done in the name of the people of these countries? Uh, how can your work be used? And a, a supplementary question. Um, I speak to a lot of Palestinians. Salman, you took the trouble because of your own personal refugee status, the violation of your rights. You took the, uh, embarked on an odyssey, an odyssey that started off with finding out about your own land. I remember one remark you made to me that shocked me. A lot of Palestinians I know have title deeds to the land from which they were driven. But you said something remarkable. You said that those are useful, but Palestinians don't need them to assert their rights to their property currently in Palestine. Can, can you develop that point, Salman? I think it's really dramatic. Uh, yes, Mick. Um, let, 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 me, let me just start by saying JNF uh, can be listed as a war criminal. No question about that. Because... Hmm. Before 1948, 
when the Hagana attacked us uh, with 120,000 soldiers from Europe, the um, JNF directed the operations of Haganah. They actually told them, we need this piece of land, go this way. They gave them the information they have about um, uh, uh, the village. They also, um, when the village was attacked and the people were expelled, they actually literally with their bulldozers demolished the village. So they demolished uh, these villages. Let me just um, describe to you a little anomaly here, which relates to what you have just shown us. If you were able to see the Palestinian landscape after the destruction of villages, what will you see? You will see a pile of stones where a house once stood. You will see a lone wall from a mosque or a broken tower, bell tower from a church or a marble piece of a grave. The landscape is thrown with evidence of evil. The JNF converted this evil into a virtue. How come they do that? They planted this, uh, the site to hide the evidence of crime with trees, non-indigenous trees, trees, forests, and all that. And then to add salt to injury, they went round to all the cities in which they have influence in, in Europe. And they rewarded its leaders by giving them the name of the park they planted on the ruins of Palestinian villages. So when you see a park named by some politician in, in Europe or America, he is hiding the grave of a dead city, a dead village. That's what we call converting evil into a virtue. And um, it's amazing that the world did not see the crime behind the facade of, um, of um, charity and so on, and it's called the self. Imagine that, that JNF is registered in 41 countries and many other cities as an environment improvement um, organization, which is tax-free, but in fact, it is an environment destruction organization. It's, uh, it's a th thievery, a robbery organization of a land. 372 villages today, its land is taken over by the JNF and their people are refugees within few kilometers from that site. So um, this is what people should know, that people should know about the road of JNF. It's amazing that they could actually uh, recruit so many leading personalities in the Western cities and so on to help them cover the crime by honoring them in a, in a wood or a park. Um, we can easily trace each location. What was it and whose land was it? And Mick, you have helped in previous occasions to show the case of some Palestinians whose land was taken over by JNF and they are refugees today. If you like more clarification, I'd be glad to do that. No, I, I have 101 questions and uh, we don't have enough time to deal with them. Um, Khaled, uh, Palestinian from Edinburgh, uh, asked the question, uh, Salman, I'll read the question. Where am I likely to find deeds to my grandfather's property in Haifa from the British Mandate Archives? I don't know where to begin. I live in Edinburgh and the house in Haifa still exists and it's been sealed off under the absentee property law. Can you, can you help 
Khalid, and others like him, many of them, on where they should start. I presume mm. they start with your atlas, but where should they then go on, Salman? Yes, I, I, I received such questions before. Let me start by saying something basic. There is not one acre in Israel today, whether in a land it occupied 48 or 1967, there is not one acre in which Israel has obtained with any legal means. None of them. Israel does not have a single acre of Palestinian land obtained by legal means or peaceful means or by agreed means. Absolutely not. Now you could say to me easily that when the British left the land um, controlled by the Jews, Jewish settlers was 6%. And we know that. Then they took by far 78%. But I claim even those 6% due the British mandate was obtained by collusion of the British by creating laws which facilitated that. Even that 6% is illegal. So here is a country now recognized by over 160. Someone, members. can I interrupt you very briefly? <clears throat> the 6% was obtained with great cruelty, for sure. Um, and that's well documented in the memoirs of Zionists that when they obtained control over a piece of Palestine, they expelled the tillers, the cultivators, and they drove them into poverty. Uh, yes. That's clear. Um, no. Are you saying it's also illegal? Uh, and can you help that point? Yes. I mean, because... we, okay, 94%, they cannot claim anything, but the other 6%, can we close the gap on that, Simon? Because Balfour Declaration is illegal. You can't give away what you don't have. I can't tell you, Mick, that I grant you the uh, Buckingham Palace. I don't own Buckingham Palace. And uh, you don't have right to Buckingham Palace. I can't grant you that. And if I do that by, by twisting, by arms, by this, this is a um, collusion of robbery. So Balfour Declaration itself. But I bought, Buckingham, I bought Buckingham Palace from a man in London a few years ago. Uh, good for you. <laughs> so so, uh, so if, I, if I start from that, that there is not one acre uh, obtained by Zionist settlers. I'm excluding, of course, before 1917, Jews who were Ottoman subjects or Palestinian subjects, they normally, like any other normal citizen, peaceful citizens, like the German Templars, for example, they, they, they had land obtained willingly, easily, but other than that, no. Now, with this assumption, we can go one step further. We could say that all land in Palestine is owned and used and lived in by Palestinians over many hundred thousand of years. I keep saying to people, and they find it a little strange, that Jerusalem is Palestinian longer than London is English. We are the same people. People. Uh, the apologists for Israel, they say they were here 2,000 years ago and they returned. We tell them we never left and we are the true inhabitants of the country. So having saying that, and then you see that the land of, of Khalid and people like him has taken away from them, I say you don't have to worry about that because the onus is on the settler who came from a smuggler ship in the middle of the night from Poland or from um, other places in Russia. And the onus is on him, Polish, Russian or whatever, to prove that he has a piece of land in Palestine. And the rest is Palestinian and therefore the ownership is not in question. If you talk about, if you talk about records, we have 453,000 records, individual records of land ownership for people. 
th this is not a subject of dispute. Even people probably don't know that the United Nations support that. The United Nations every year in November, and I think I sent you a copy of one resolution of that, they meet in the United Nations and they have a resolution under the refugees revenue saying Israel is bound to calculate how much gain, how much rent, how much use they have um, taken from refugees land and they have to put it in record because this doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the original owner. No occupation grants the second occupant right to ownership. And uh, the question is not whether an individual like Khalid or not can produce a piece of paper saying they are the land. The question is how to employ the international law. The problem is that United States and some countries, including UK and Germany, are against that because they created Israel in the first place for double purpose, to remove the Jews from their countries and to use them as a colonial post in the Middle East. These, this double objective is working for them. Therefore, they have no interest to, um, to bring back uh, the land to its people. But they will not succeed because we are now 13 million people no, uh, uh, half of them, or more than half, live on the soil of Palestine. And the others are around it. And those around it, like Khaled, have not given up on their heritage. So the problem for us is not the truth. We know the truth. It's not the law. The law is very clear. It's not um, the, um, the system by which we can employ the law. The problem is Israel and supporters who work against law and justice through their power, through their armaments, through their financial power, which dictates the, what people read and see. This is what we're up against. In other words, Palestinian people, 13 million of them, who are peaceful, who have no airplanes, no nuclear bombs, are up against people or a state or a system which has nuclear bombs, it has the support, uh, actually sometimes running some Western countries daily. That is the problem. But that history tells us will not succeed. Khaled asks where, if he wants to find documents, where should he look, Salman? We we accept your arguments, absolutely. But um, are the archives in queue? Uh, the Ottoman records were recently released, I believe, um, to an authority in Jordan, if my memory is right. If Arabic speakers or other speakers wish to go through these documents, where should they go? Where can they go? Um, I understand the motive to obtain a piece of paper saying I have inheritance i have land fine if you want to do that this is for personal satisfaction you can go to nasr al qidwa yasser arafat foundation they said that they have digitized this data and that they have now it available and they can answer questions individual questions on that go to yasser arafat foundation headed now by Nasser Qidwa, they can answer you specifically about um, your, your property. But this is for your own satisfaction to tell your children and so on. The case is solved in one go. When apartheid Israel, when Zionist uh, Israel is no more in power, all this land can be given back to its people through a very simple system. Today, the land taken by Israel of the refugees is run by land, Israel Land Administration. Very few Israelis today have a title deed 
title deed of a land they have taken from a Palestinian. It's all run by the government. And so in the time, which no doubt will come, the land will go back to its owners. There will be a transfer from the authority of Israel Land Administration to something I call Palestine Land Administration. And with that, all the village lands return to its people. We have maps and areas of every village land. We can give it back to the village people. Individually, they sort it out among themselves. So the transfer of ownership when justice uh, is made to happen can be done easier than any other country, easier than Bosnia, easier than other countries in which invaders took the property of the people of the land. I've got a question here, uh, Salman, and it's very important for those of us in Stop the GNF. Um, Sonia, from, I, I guess, from, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, asks, uh, she has a list of Dutch GNF projects. Uh, so these are the, the, the activities in Palestine funded by uh, GNF KKL Netherlands. She would like to identify them on your map. Can you give us some advice? And I would be interested in that advice as well, and so would other people. Let me give very warm greetings to my friend, Sonia. She's a dear friend. I know her for many years because, how do I know her? Because she was one of the very first people in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Holland um, who supported Palestine. Greetings to you, my dear Sonia. Now, um, to know the location, uh, uh, to know, uh, yes, hello, hello, Sonia. Very nice to see that you are still on the right path uh, pursuit of justice in Palestine. Um, the, uh, I have produced a book called The Return Journey. And in this atlas, I uh, chart all village lands, where the village lands are, the boundaries of the village land. Also the main features of the village, such as um, the cemetery, the remaining, and the mosque, the church, and so on. And on top of that, I uh, show the lands taken over by Jewish National Fund, the limits of that land, and also by other, by other um, Zionist settlement organizations. And I also show on the map the present system of roads. Um, Israel destroyed the old system of roads leading to the dis destroyed villages, of course. But now we have this system, um, the present system. And through that system, you can actually drive um, along the new system of roads and it leads you to your village and to identify your land there. A lot of people have done that. And I believe there is an application called I Nakba done by Zohrot. You can click on it from where you are and say, I want to go to Ajur, for example. It leads you to that. If you open the relevant page in my atlas called Return Journey, you can see where your land is, and you see which kibbutz are built on that land. And you can also see um, which Zionist colonial organization, whether JNF or others, uh, is utilizing the robbed land, the stolen land. You can do that. Um, uh, a lot of people, not a lot, but people can make uh, trips, uh, refugees go to trips to their land and, um, and uh, see who is using it. Uh, one of the important things we have done, did the population study who lives in the refugee land. We found that almost all refugee, refugee land, rural, rural village lands are still empty. They have only the kibbutz, which is one to two percent of the Israeli population was still empty. We have found that 
people can return to their villages without displacement um, to many, very few, if they wish to live in a democratic Palestine. And so that's another sad thing. The laws are our side, logistics on our side. History, whether immediate or past, is on our side, geography on our side. How could we see this happening in this stage? How could we see it in front of our eyes? No, very key. I remember you made that point some years ago at an event in Scotland, a long time ago, and it struck me and it stayed away that most of the stolen land remains empty uh, without habitations. Um, and that therefore the return is not just uh, right, just and political, it's also feasible um, uh, logistically. Salman, can I change the subject slightly? Um, you, 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 um, we have individuals who want to oppose the JNF. They have been violated, their family has been violated, their village has been violated, and the Palestinian people have been violated. And they don't wish to push forward on an egotistical basis. They want to tell the story of the Palestinian people, but it helped if they can tell their individual story uh, uh, as part of that. Um, you know, the story of slavery was told through, I remember the series Roots. It, 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 it created a character who epitomized, who represented the whole horrible history of slavery. Paul Kellerman asks, and in, in, it's in the spirit that a lot of land was under collective Palestinian ownership by a whole village. So how can ownership of these lands be asserted? Not in an egotistic as about the other spirit, but how can we tell the story of individuals within the wider uh, crimes against the Palestinian people? I would, I would encourage every Palestinian who's living in Europe, for example, or America, that means he has freedom of movement, to search for his village land. And um, this is not difficult. We can help them. Uh, um, we have also records of the Palestinians who are refugees. The refugees record uh, is very well established. We know where they are today in which camp. And many of them, of course, are uh, outside the Arab area. So I would encourage every Palestinian who can do that in Europe, for example, to go with many of his friends from England, from Scotland, um, to Palestine. Uh, that's after he shows them where his land is. To go on a trip and let them see this fact on the ground. Now, I'm not naive enough to say that the Israelis will let them come, but some will get through. And when they get through, the, 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 the truth will be clear. If they go there, they can see the land, they can knock on the door of someone living in a house belongs to some Palestinian and say, hey, I am the owner of this house. I could have been born here. My father is born here. And what are you doing? There is a case, by the way, recorded in video of such a case. Mm. People went and so, and they are met with extreme nonchalance. The settlers on the land say, ah, that was history. This is our, our house now. And the people who claim to the whole world, they are victims of persecution. They answer the owner of the house, living person, coming to see his house, saying, no, this is all history. Amazing, amazing. I mean, Arnold Toynbee described that um, very beautifully in his study of history, how the people who have been persecuted should turn immediately to be uh, persecutors of first class. They even advanced the, the, the art of persecution. So. To summary then, to summary, I would suggest take many of your friends from the country where you are living in, go together, they will see if you are allowed to come in, they will see if they allow, um, the, or you or they are allowed to enter, go and see the place and then knock on the door and say, this is my, my house, what do you say? 
Um, video that story, video that story. Tell it to your school, your university, tell it to your newspaper if they dare to publish it um, before they are described as being anti-Semite. Um, I don't see the connection. If you go to recover your home, how come you are anti-Semite? But that's another story. Of course, it's, it's preposterous. Um, yeah, but what I'm saying is, uh, Mick, is I am so much in favor and a great believer in facing the robber and the criminal. And whatever they do, they may, they may put you in jail for two days or three days. They may do more than this. They may let you come in. And the stories you get um, are worth being told to the whole world. Here are people. I mean, we're not talking about Romans or this and that. We're talking about people who are kicked out and, and they want to recover their inheritance. Let this world be around the world. I am sure, like Sonia Zimmerman, there are many people uh, who are Jews themselves, but they, are, they could be sympathetic to this case. Let there be uh, uh, a movement from, from Jews who do not believe um, in, the, uh, in the injustice to Palestinians. Although I don't have much experience in positive response, but let us worth a try, worth a try. Well, others can help to organize. You say that some will get through Tel Aviv Airport, that's for sure. Um, some of us got through many times before being chucked in prison, but it was only for a few days. And uh, we, were not to we were not tortured as Palestinians are. It was actually not too bad. Um, but if an individual wishes to act in the spirit and, uh, that Salman's just suggested, I have to say, if somebody was living in my house, wherever they were, I would want to challenge them directly and film the uh, the process. Then if the individual doesn't get through, there are friends and comrades who will be able to help, who might even, who can even carry a camera and live stream for you if you're prevented from getting to your property under Zionist control in Palestine. Salman, I want to ask you a couple of really important questions, if I may, but after you. No, no I, I just want to say, um, I just saw a note about JVP. I really admire um, uh, everybody who is supporting justice, especially if they are supposed to be on the side of the aggressor and they deny that and they don't approve that. I have seen many good examples of uh, Jews. I'm sure, Mick, you know many of them. Ilan Pape, for example, and I don't want to mention names because I may miss some. Um, honest people, very honest people who say um, we are against injustice, no matter who, um, who creates it. We are not tribalistic, stick by our religion uh, against injustice. Uh, I have seen good examples of that, and they are very active. I know they are also, they were, or they are uh, vilified by the Zionists uh, in their community, but they still, uh, I, I met in Australia, for example, very good people who in 1939, their families, their families um, immigrated from Romania and Hungary um, to Palestine. And I met one of them who's, who was my age. And he said, when we came to Palestine, they gave us the house of a Palestinian. We entered the house. He was a child then. Uh, we found hot food, found bed, unmade bed. We found this, people were kicked out in a hurry. And so they found this so revolting and they left Israel immediately, and now they live in Australia. There are many examples like that. But I must say, the people who stand up and speak in public, Jews who stand up and speak in public, are like Palestinians. They are also vilified by Zionists. But uh, many of them don't, I mean, they have the courage to stay on course. So this, uh, I, I load the support of Jews who support justice in Palestine. Why? Because 
Other Zionists say you are against Jews. Now, when Jews speak on side of justice, that, that of course squashes their argument. They are first and foremost a human being, civilized, and if they don't like uh, the injustice made to them, they should don't dislike it made to others. Uh, I'm sure you have probably have heard about the lady uh, in Germany who was hounded um, uh, by, uh, by Zionists. She, I think her name is Nirit. She is an artist and she is a well-known uh, person in Germany. And she simply says, I am against persecution of Jews and I am also against about any other persecution by anybody. And she, she's hounded and she's described as terrible names. This is happening today in Germany. So when Jews speak up for justice, I think this is a very good sign that the human spirit is still alive. Salman Abu Sitta, it's four minutes to the top of the hour. It's always a huge pleasure. Before you go, tell us about your seminal talk in 17 days at SOAS. It's a very revealing title. Uh, can you talk about it for a couple of minutes? Because I will be listening or viewing, and I think other people, the, many of the viewers here should also join for that talk as well. Can you tell us about it, uh, Salman, your, your talk at SOAS? Uh well, the title is 11 Kinds of Wars Waged Against Palestinians. Uh, will that um, eliminate their presence? And I uh, talk, I already mentioned a number of points. Sorry, can I, can I interrupt you? Can I interrupt you, yeah. Salman? It was how Palestinians are coping with their elimination. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, how Palestinians are coping with their constant attempts of uh, elimination, elimination. Um, and 11 kinds of wars waged against them still on. Um, it really is an example of how simple people, um, how simple people, uh, defenseless people with their spirit and determination can beat a concerted force of European power, both inside Europe and outside it, to eliminate them. And well, this is a unique story. I, I say this in conclusion. Um, sometimes, make, I know it sounds so poetic or something. Um, I feel ashamed of the future generations when they read about us, they say that in this century and the one before, there was so much injustice and so much crimes committed and we, the people of the world, could not stand up and fight it. What will they tell us, our great-grandchildren? What they will say us? How come you allow this to happen? How come? But that will be in the future. I hope the near present will change that. And by the way, I can see notes from your friends, Hayim and all the friends, greeting to, to them. They are doing great work and they are standing uh, against so much vilification, but they stand for justice. I'm going to ask you to do something, uh, Salman. Um, there is your time a is up. Your time is up. <laughs> no, I'm going to ask you to do something. There's a World Climate uh, Conference. The UN Climate Conference will take place in my home city of Glasgow in November this year. It'll be gigantic. The great and the bad will be there, and they'll be pretending that they're stopping the world from burning. Um, but there will be huge numbers of protesters and decent people there as well, thronging the city. The JNF presents itself, as you know, an environmental camp, you know, an environmentalist group. 
And I suspect they will, and they may well have the temerity to be there in Glasgow on that day, um, masquerading not as a crime syndicate, but as an environmental campaigning group. Will you support the call from Stop the JNF for a mobilization in Glasgow on that day to ensure that the JNF cannot misrepresent itself as other than a criminal organization? Salman, your endorsement will be valuable. Mike, uh, I don't think you need to ask me this question. We have been together for a long time. There is no question that we'll always stand for justice. I mean, the value of the human spirit is if it stands for justice. Otherwise, what are we, a tree or an animal? If we then stand for justice, what's the value of our life? How can we talk to our grandchildren? And there is no question. There is no question. Nobody uh, can say, it's not my mission. It's the mission of everybody, everybody uh, to speak for justice. Because if you are not the victim today, you will be probably the victim tomorrow. And that's why I uh, load again the effort of Jews like Nerit in Germany, who says, I am, it's never again, it should be never again. Never again for us Jews and for anybody else. We are not privileged victims. We never again persecution for any person, not only for Jews. Um, that is the spirit uh, which um, is very admirable. And your work, Mick, you, know, you, you are a Scotsman and you stand for justice. And I keep telling you, I'm sure you'll get tired of me hearing this. Uh, I do what I'm doing because I'm selfish. I lost my home and my land. And if, no. if, if, if this land is in Manchuria, maybe I'll just be continuing reading newspaper. So, but you, what you do is you stand for justice. You don't have a house lost, but you don't like to see somebody losing his house or land. And thank you very much for that. Friends, let me end by saying something. Salman Abu Sitha lies. He could easily have struck a dirty deal and saved his own property. It's possible. He has committed himself to Palestinian people as a collective, the opposite of selfish. And I pay tribute to this. Thank you. Thank Amazing you. Amazing individual. And I want to paraphrase what he says. He's urging you to come to Glasgow in November to take on the GN. And friends, don't just, you've come and you've heard a, a, a tremendous presentation. Join, get in touch with Stop the JNF in Scotland or the UK or wherever you are. There is work to be done and you can make a difference. Again, thank you very much to Salman Abu Sitta. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today uh, in the UK and internationally. And thank you from, this is Mick Napier here from Stop the JNF, uh, thanking you. Let us go forward. And uh, in the spirit of what Salman has said, we will win. Thank you we, and good. We will win. We will win. Thank you very much, Mick. Thank you. We will certainly win. La shukra ala wajib. Ma salama. Ma salama. Thank you.